Hi, I'm Dr. David Day of Samurai Digital Security, and this is 404 Cybersecurity Not Found, telling cybersecurity a new R since 2015. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our podcast. I'm joined today by a man who needs no introduction, but he's getting one anyway. It's it's Dr. David Day, the Managing Director of Samurai Digital Security. So today, Dave, I want to talk about quantum physics, um, a topic which I know nothing about. So please, in, in the most simplest terms, what is it? What is quantum physics? Uh, yeah, sure. So um, so yeah, just just to broaden that out, I'm happy happy to talk about it in the uh, in the context ultimately of uh, of quantum computing. So how what you know what quantum physics is uh, is going to mean in terms of quantum computing and and indeed what com- quantum computing is going to to mean in terms of uh, you know its potential effects on cryptography um and you know wider implications on that in general as well um but to so so to start by answering you know your your first question quantum physics is the science of the very very small so it's the study of particles the size of an atom or smaller, or the particles that actually make up an atom, for instance, quarks, and also the waves and the forces that work with atoms and light. I mean that, that that's about as much as I can give you in its in its very simplest form. But it's important to emphasise that in the quantum realm, things are very very weird so we're used to working in the you know in newtonian physics in a in the classical sense you know um you know you see a pen on the on the desk you pick it up and it's in your hand and it's solid it's tangible um everything feels nice and predictable for us in terms of what we see and what we're aware of and sense and when you start delving into the quantum world you realize that our perception of reality is very different to how reality really is. It's a it's a very strange and weird realm indeed. Okay, explain to me how it's weird. Hmm. Okay. Well, I can give you some examples um, that might help in terms of explaining the weirdness of it, if you like. If we think about atomic and subatomic levels you know we talk about these particles as i said before they're they're you know it's just unimaginably small you know we're talking about distances in in nanometers um and and this is where classical physics breaks down and you know there's there's there, there are examples of weirdness and 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 uh, for example there's the uh the double slit experiment which is often cited as a sort of classical how weird is quantum experiment which uh in in its in its simplest terms is um where you shine a light through a slit and uh you know it is uh then you detect the light on a back plane between two two slits in, in a in a plane and uh it, how it how it is shown on the plane is different depending on whether it's observed or not and uh that's strange it's like you know observing something changes how it acts which is odd how does it know it knows you're looking a bit weird uh and there's also something called the epr paradox uh which einstein and robert uh podolsky and nathan rosen um came up with uh concerning uh how entangled particles appear to communicate over a distance so i mean i'm 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 happy to talk about those in in more detail um if uh, if you want me to go down that route please do it doesn't make sense but <laughs> go ahead <laughs> okay all right so if we consider like so so let me talk about the double slit experiment right give give you a bit more um detail on that the, there's always been this discussion that revolves around whether light exists as as a wave or a particle and at least at this point in time we don't really have a good answer 
the the truth is it seems to act as both but if you imagine a light source and imagine that light source shining through um, a singular slit and then imagine that light going from that singular slit shines outward and then hits uh, a, a screen with with two slits in it so you've got a single light source hitting a screen with two slits uh, you know, vertical slits and then the light shines through through both of those slits so I, I'm gonna I'm gonna you know I'm gonna ask you Brad like what how how would you expect that to appear if you had if if, if a light was shining through two vertical splits mm-hmm. on a screen what would you expect to see behind that screen surely two lines of light right I mean that that is what you expect to see strangely it isn't what you see right so you'd expect to see that if we're if we if we if we think of light as traveling in particles or you know in terms they're they're called photons in physics right so if if we if, if we think of light traveling in terms of these small particles these photons um and the particles could go through either of the two slits we would imagine some will go through one slit and some will go through the other slit right and we'll end up with with two vertical lines but actually that isn't what happens what actually happens is we receive we get rather on the back plane the appearance on the screen of uh multiple bars um four bars uh and they're not clearly defined either because th- these are uh interference bars and th- and this is what you would expect if light was traveling in a wave because essentially what would happen is you would split the the light traveling in a wa- in a wave into two waves and those waves would hit the screen and they would interfere with each other so at some point the the waves would would add together to to form a a a a larger crest and then in other places the waves would cancel each other out and you and you wouldn't see any light a bit like if you if you were to throw two stones into a pond and you'd see the ripples right some places they cancel each other out sometimes they 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 add to each other and that that is actually what you see Right, that 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 is what if you did this experiment, you know, at home, set it up, that's what you'd see. Um, which, when it was first done, of course, everybody thought, oh, okay, so uh, all you know, we 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 weren't sure whether light was a wave or a particle. So because we have these interference bars, right, it 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 must be a wave, right? It was logical. You'd think, except it was discovered that hitting the back plane hitting that screen they were still particles so now it doesn't make sense because now it's exhibiting like you know you can see that a particles hit you can see the individual particles hitting the screen but this thing is behaving like a wave because you've got interference bars so then the scientists thought well right okay we, we you know we don't understand it so we need to know more so technology moved on and they devised methods of actually detecting the uh, on the slits which slit the photons went through so they could actually see are the photons going through let's call slits a and b are are the photons going through slit a or slit b and they started looking at them right to determine which they went through now what they actually saw as a result of that was pretty remarkable because as soon as they set up a, a situation in which it could be identified and this this experiment has been repeated many many times by the way with with multiple different forms of equipment so you know the argument that the equipment um interfered with the experiment in the, in the classical physics sense has nigh on been eliminated now you know that's that's not considered plausible but what they spotted was as you said at the start what you would imagine two vertical bars so it's changed it's changed just on the fact that we've looked at it its observation has changed its state and and this is something which is fundamental to quantum physics and in particular quantum computing which we'll come to is the fact that the the measurement of particles can change their behavior 
So they, it changes, you know, by looking at the slit, you, you, you know, does it go through A or B? Once you look at this, once you observe the slit and, you know, see which one it goes through, the, 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 the waveform collapses or the, they, you know, in, in quantum physics terms, they call it a probability wave. That probability wave collapses and all of a sudden um, it starts to act like, uh, like particles rather than a wave. Uh, so, so that that's how it works for for the double slit experiment. Um, um, uh, I think it might be worth touching on on uh, EPR as well. Yeah. Okay. E EPR. Then I, I'm going to pretend I understood uh, your explanation. Could you give me more <laughs> background with EPR? Yeah, I can. Yeah. Um, I can. I, well, I can try. Right. <laughs> but uh, it's. Uh, yeah, I can. I'm sure I can. Um, right. So um, with EPR. This is a, a, another example of quantum weirdness, right? So one of the things with, with quantum particles is the subatomic particles I'm talking about here, is that it's possible for certain particles to become what they term entangled. And by entangled, I mean the particles um, act as one complete system. So, so they, they interact with each other. And as an example of the, 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 the properties you could have with these uh, particles that become entangled, they, they, each one of them could, could have either um, a spin up or a spin down. It doesn't matter what it means, right? Just think of it in terms of, I don't know, the different state. It, the, the, what it actually means isn't important. It can be at this point, at least at this level. It can be this uh, up spin or it can be down spin. And again, as we explained with the double slit experiment, when you measure quantum particles, you can affect their properties. So in this case, you know, as, as, as soon as you measure to determine whether a particular particle is an upspin or a downspin, it will then become either an upspin or a downspin. So as soon as you measure it, it's almost like at that point it decides which it is. Quantum computing is very confusing, and I know that as you know, there'll be quantum physicists out there that won't like me using that word, but you know, I need to try and make this as simple as possible. So uh, it, until you measure it, you don't know, and as soon as you measure it, it decides, right? So, in other words, before you measure it, it doesn't actually exist as upspin or downspin. It's in what we call a state of superposition. So it exists in, in both states simultaneously. So it's not, like, it's not like you just don't know whether it's, one, you know whether it's an upspin or a downspin. It actually isn't in either state until you look at it, until you measure it. And at the point where you measure it, it will become either upspin or downspin, which in itself is insane, right? Um, you... you, you and anybody who claims they can, by the way, I don't believe them. I'll look at them very suspiciously if they claim to me that that makes perfect sense to them, right? That that they can they that that sits comfortably with them in terms of logical, because I don't believe that's possible. Um, as as beings that exist outside of the quantum realm, I don't think we can ever look at the quantum realm and and see it as making sense because it's just that's that's not where we live. We don't you know, we're not in that environment uh, in terms of our, at least our consciousness doesn't seem to be. Our understanding doesn't seem to be so to go back again right so that so so the, it, amazing though that is it becomes even more amazing when you consider that these two entangled particles have an effect on each other so in other words if one of them is going to be upspin the other one will be downspin and vice versa right now here's the weird thing these particles don't need to be near each other okay so you could have entangled particles and you know one of them could be at one side of the universe and one of them could be at the other side of the universe and if you observe if you measure the spin on one of the particles it will immediately affect the other so in other words if i look at one of the particles and it's up spin the other one that's on the other side of the universe immediately then decides it's down spin so it's almost like there's been a communication across the entire universe between these two particles. Now, you know, we were always taught, weren't we, you know, that you can't exceed the speed of light, but it would appear, wouldn't it, that information has now traveled faster than the speed of light in order for that to happen. It's just 
it, it hasn't actually, and there's reasons why, uh, which we're not going to go into today. Nevertheless, though, it's pretty amazing, wouldn't you say? That's pretty, pretty I think so, at least. I think that's pretty, pretty shocking. Um, Einstein called this spooky action at a distance, and he didn't buy it at all, right? He, he, he like, he, he actually, he was actually using it as an example of why quantum uh, physics is nonsense. He didn't like quantum physics. Einstein wasn't a fan at all. But unfortunately for Einstein, test after test after test after test has shown this to be the case. Um, and, you know, I, I, Einstein died trying to disprove this stuff, right? So uh, if Einstein died trying to disprove it, then clearly I think it's it's fair to 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 give some um, you know have some compassion for those that don't understand it. I don't fully understand it. Nobody fully understands it because it doesn't make sense. All we can do is say that when we do X, Y happens. Um, so we've observed these things happening. So in other words, we've observed the fact that quantum particles exist in more than one state at the same time. And that's the, that's the takeaway from, from this part, um, you know, before I sort of go on and, so and, and talk about anything, you know, further to that. Existing in two states at once, the, the state of superposition, um, when you mentioned about the double split experiment, Prior to measurement, is that the is that what the particles are in superposition? Yes. Right. Okay. That makes a little more sense now. Yes. The 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 neither the you know I mean when we talked about the double slit experiment, it was a little bit different because we're actually talking about you know whether they went through one one slit or another right in the mm -hmm. double slit experiment. It's been argued right that before they're measured, they're actually going through both the slits at the same time. They could have either gone through slit A or slit B with equal chance uh that's how you think about it in classical terms but in, in quantum terms you know they're not either going through a or b they're going through both and neither right <laughs> okay um right so it's it's you know it is it is it is pretty confusing I, I mean really the takeaway that i'm trying to get to i mean when we talked about the the particles with the spin that was that was showing you the same thing but but ultimately with epr and with the double slit experiment the the takeaway is that quantum particles will behave differently depending on whether they're observed and also probably more importantly uh quantum particles can um do more than what can be more than one thing at the same time these properties can be multiple contradictory uh, uh, you know appearing to be contradictory in classical physics um properties at the same time right so like i said before you know you can have a uh, 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 an electron, for example, that has both upspin and downspin at the same time, <laughs> simultaneously. And it doesn't become one or the other until it's measured. Right. So what does this Okay, mean well, here's the thing. Or... I might, listen, I'll tell you what, this has just come to me, right? Imagine you've got a, I don't know if it's really like this, okay, but let's, let's play, let's pretend. Imagine, imagine you, you, you spin a dice on a table. And you know, you know what I mean, spin? You know, we're like the, with the corner of the dice is on the table and the whole dice spins yeah. around, right? You spin it with your fingers, right? And I said to you, what number is it? What would you say? It's still, so, and, it, and it's spinning. No, it's spinning. What would you say? It, it, it isn't. It isn't a number. Well, because, well it's got to be. to be determined. Well, look, well, it's, it's, it's either, well, what is it? Is it one, two, three, four, five, six? What is it? None of them. And all of them, right? It could be any of them. And I don't know, like, it's not, a, it's not a great example, and it's not, there isn't a direct comparison there, but I'm saying, until you actually stop it and measure it, it isn't, it isn't in a particular state, is it? Mm. It's not a great example. I mean, I'll level with that. It's not a great example, but I'm, you know, I'm trying here with a, with a subject that's very, very difficult. I, I, I think it might, so, it, I mean, do, do you want me to sort of like put this in terms of quantum computing, maybe do a comparison between quantum and classic? Yeah, we understand traditional computing quite well, at least I'd hope, in a cybersecurity company, right? How, what effect does this have on traditional computing? Okay, so I, I, I would, I, I'd like to sort of, we're, we're going to have to go back and think about how classical computing works briefly to, to, to then see how quantum computing can be um, something quite special if, if it meets all the promises which it's um, promising. So if we, if we think about classical computing, right, for example, traditionally in, in classical computing, the, the smallest units of calculations are bits, right? And a bit can be either zero or one, right? You, know, you remember from, uh, from when you were at school doing binary, zero or one. 
And the, the way these are physically constructed is as transistors, which, um, you know, they, you, you, they turn on or not. I won't go to our transistors. They, you, you can turn them on or off. There's a ways of turning them on or off, right? So they can either be on or they're off, right? Um, and you can, you can get billions of these on-off transistors on, on uh, a piece of silicon the size of your fingernail, right? So, um, and, and the calculations which a computer needs to do the things it does um, at, 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 its, at its base level, ultimately, everything in computing ends up as zeros and ones, right? It's binary. Um, so the smallest unit of calculations, its fundamental unit of calculation is... Uh, is a bit is a is a is a a, a zero or one um so i think i think it's it's important to know that before we start thinking about quantum computing so instead of using bits instead of using zeros and ones right so we, we, we've talked about so there's these things called qubits right and we've took so we've talked and that's what's used so so in quantum computing they use qubits in traditional computing they use bits in quantum computing qubits quantum bits makes sense right um, they'd call it that. Not very inventive, but there you go. Uh, and and we, we've talked about superposition. We've talked about how quantum particles can be in in multiple states at the same time, right? So with qubits, so with bits, we have them, they can either be in a state zero or one. With a qubit, um, it's, it's either zero or one at any given time, right? So it's not it's not that it exists in a value between zero and one. It's actually it's a, it actually is zero uh, and one at the same time simultaneously, right? Uh, which which doesn't is struggle to get your head around. But this is what we've seen in in, in observations. Okay, again, I don't think people really understand, but we've seen it in observations. If we see something in observation, the more we observe something and 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 and, and see it happening, then we, you know once we've reached the point where we can predict what will happen because we understand it, we've seen it, well, we don't understand it, but we've seen it so many times we can predict it, then then we can start building things with it because it's this predictable behavior there. In in uh, classical computing, let's say that you have a system, I mean, you know, now, you know, systems now 32, 64 bits, that's what we talk about when we talk about 32 or 64 bit systems. Uh, but but let's, for the sake of simplicity, right, pretend we're still at the, uh, still at two bits, right? Um, so in classical computing, if we have two bits, we've got four states. Right? It could be zero, 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 one, one, zero, or one, one. In quantum computing, we have the same four states, but we have them simultaneously at the same time. Imagine you're uh, in a maze, okay? Um, and somebody's put you in the middle of that. They've dropped you in the middle of the maze because, you know, they're gits. And they've said, uh, find your way out. Um, you know, uh, some kind of... Uh, <laughs> You know, let, let, let's pretend it's the maze from The Shining, right? Because that's fun. Um, and they've dropped you in the middle of the maze, and <laughs> and you and you need and you and it's cold, right? You know, and some guys after you with an axe, so it's not good. Uh, and you need to <laughs> you need to find your way out. Um, normally, what you do is you try each path, right? You you try one path. Oh shit, got that wrong. Or, or, unless you know that thing where you know keep the wall to your left. Forget about all that. That's not that's boring. Right, but let's pretend that you devise a way of trying to find your way out and you're going to go with trial and error, right? So you try one path. Okay, that hasn't worked. I'll try another path. Mm, that didn't work. And you keep trying all the different paths, don't you? Until eventually, if you, as long as you have the ability to remember where you've been, that's quite important, you will ultimately get out, right? So you go down one path. Okay, it wasn't that. I remember that didn't work. Next path, i try that. Okay, that didn't work. Let's try the next one. And you'll move through them all, won't you? Sequentially. If you picture this in terms of what the what how this would work in terms of quantum, uh, you would try all of the paths simultaneously and find which one worked. Right, so it all it would be it would be instantaneous. All paths tried, loads of them failed. One of them worked. You go down the one that worked. So you could uh, hopefully that gives you an idea of of how how much quicker it can be if mm. we're in a situation where you know we can we can have you know we could be working with multiple states at the same time. So when you have a computer program um, with, with with a very um, clear path of ones and zeros that you have to go through to execute the end of that program, mm -hmm. it would do it, well, infinitely times faster, if, I, if my understanding's right. Uh, insanely quicker. Yeah, much, much, much quicker. 
Um, is it just four times as fast because it can be in four different places at the same time or e even faster? Well, we're only talking about we're, we're talking about a system there with two bits, aren't we? And it's not four times faster. It's it's you know, um, I mean, it would appear four times faster. I mean, in, you know, if you if if you think of it in that way, but it, it doesn't. If I'm honest, it doesn't really work like that. Not exactly like that. I'm just trying to give you a sort of a loose grasp. Mm -hmm. So the more um, I, bits that you add to the equation, the the more it compounds in terms of how, how much faster it is. Yeah, for sure. So, you know, the more qubits wow. that you have, the quicker it's going to be. And, and, and you, you may hear online about, you know, some system that, has, you know, uses more qubits and they get excited about it and all the rest of it. Um, I, I I think it's fair to add at this point, though, that, that people talk about, you know, quantum supremacy and that, you know, quantum computers um, working faster than their classical counterparts. But... Just a word of caution about getting too excited about all of that, because as of yet, at least, unless they're not telling us something, which I wouldn't be overly surprised about, um, the, the, they've not reached a point where. So they've, they've shown they've shown quantum computing working quicker than classical computing, but only when they're working out calculations that they already know the answer to. <laughs> right. So that's not actually particularly useful if you already know the answer, right? They haven't, at least. As far as I understand, unless something's changed recently, they haven't managed to do a, a put a calculation which neither system knows the answer to, and pushed it in, and quantum computing's come out on top, where they the systems don't know the answer, the the people that feeding the systems don't know the answer either. So um, I, I think there's some additional you know there's obviously additional challenges that need to be overcome there um, before we can get we can get too excited. So the increase of computing power, it can potentially be extremely beneficial. But in, are there any drawbacks to that? Are there any instances that, that could cause us harm? I think I know where you're going actually with that. You probably, I, 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 am, I imagine you're probably thinking about cryptography and, and, and the potential for, for breaking that. Is, is that what, what you're thinking there? Well, yeah, really. Any action that require that is limited to its um, its ability is limited by the amount of computing power available. A any action like that would be, you know, put on steroids in in the realm of quantum computing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, right. You're right. Cryptography is a, is an example of that. Right. So um, there's there's a number of uh, algorithms, asymmetric algorithms, such as um, as RSA which use um, prime number factoring and algorithms such as RSA, um, they, they, that's, how, that's how they make things secure by, by utilizing that um, affectation of mathematics, right? Now, one of the ways which you can, you know, you, if you wanted to kind of, you know, crack an algorithm, if you like, in, in, in that sense, would be, to, would be to brute force it. So brute forcing. So it, you know, if we're in a situation where we're talking about brute forcing, then, and we've got a situation where we've got a a system which can try multiple paths at the same time. In other words, can do multiple calculations simultaneously. Uh, you know, ho hopefully you can see that actually, you know, cracking those types of encryption is going to be extremely fast, right? Very, very fast. It hasn't happened yet that, that, that we know of, that, that uh, quantum computings have broken that form of cryptography. But, um, it's, you know, they're working on it. And, and, and to be fair, the mathematicians are also working on how to create quantum-proof cryptography as well. So it's a thing. Uh, and, you know, both sides are studying on, you know, one's studying about how to crack it using quantum computing, others are studying about how to how to keep cryptography safe. The other thing to mention as well, just because, you know, um, the, the, the sort of, uh, I'm, I'm, I missed out on that whole sort of Bitcoin um, boom. And, you know, I remember, you know, people just giving each other Bitcoins, you know, back in the day. And it just hurts me that I didn't just store a few away. But anyway, so they, they took you, yeah, obviously, you've heard about Bitcoin mining, which again is uh, using maths and, uh, and complex calculations to try to, to, to um, you know, mine the, uh, the, the, the blockchain to win these Bitcoins. And, you know, it's, it's argued that, uh, you know, even with a, a, a relative, if, if we can get the quantum computing systems 
working as we want them to. It, it would be possible to, to, to mine all the remaining Bitcoins in two seconds. I think I read somewhere. So, <laughs> so if somebody does crack quantum computing and they apply it to Bitcoin, they, they could become incredibly wealthy. So, so I mean, that's, that's maybe another, another area there where we should, should, should have a concern. It seems to me like there's a race happening um, between people that are developing quantum technology to to use it for, for bad purposes or perhaps for their own monetary gain or other gains um, and those who are developing it for good so in what ways can quantum computing be used for the benefit for the benefit of humankind i'll level with you until you ask a question i've not really fully thought about it but now i am fully thinking about it i mean if you think about you know we're talking about a system here that can perform you know billions of simultaneous calculations I mean, we can do that to some extent, you know, we, the, the, on a very, very small scale, we have, you know, we, we have a parallel processing that happens in the classical sense, you know, with, you know, uh, powerful GPUs and, um, uh, you know, ASICs, uh, asynchronous uh, integrated circuits that can do these things in parallel, but they're, 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 they're not in the hat, you know, it's a, they're almost, although we just did, almost incomparable to quantum computing in terms of you know how much parallel processing power quantum computing provides and then so when you start to think about that things that it could be used for let me think so um for good in the medical profession you know trying to make sense of of you know extremely complicated data sets in terms of you know how 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 drugs affect people and how uh, how we could test on um, different uh, non biological uh, well non human rather um, test scenarios where we could run through sort of multiple instances. I'm trying to remember the name actually of the um, organoids. That's it, organoids. <laughs> where we have these organoids, which are sort of lab-grown cells, which we can use to test drugs on, and we get, you know, all this different data back from those. How we could maybe use the the, the power of quantum computing to to help us make sense of that, right? Because we we could just perform so many more calculations so much quicker, and and DNA as well. You know how to how to to to, to read through all the issues involving genetic disorders. So I think I think there's there's probably, and you know, I haven't looked into it in any detail, but I would imagine. There's an awful lot of uh, of medical implications that could be assisted with cryptography. I have a sort of a <laughs> a Terminator type interest in AI, uh, artificial intelligence, and you know we're, we're we're at the point now where there's you know when AI first came around, artificial intelligence came around, and I remember there being a big song and dance about it in the uh, sort of early '90s, and I was sort of part of that um, that scene at that time. I was at university and. Um, there's there's a lot of us studying it and it it just seemed to show so much promise you know in terms of artificial neural nets and you know back propagation and the, the how, how they work the strengthening the strengthening or weakening the connections between them etc etc the different layers and it was all it's all an awful lot of fun um in theory but you know it, it never really met its true potential and still hasn't to be fair and it's my view that the reason it hasn't met its full potential is is the fact that we just haven't had the processing power to to make full use of that to make full use of that that modeling of the so ann it's like artificial neural networks it's the the modeling almost it's based around loosely based around how how cells how neurons within the human brain uh, interact to, to to enable us to com to do calculations and i, I you know we, we've never had a self-aware machine yet we've never had a machine that in my view has really passed the turing test i mean you know we've we've had we've had ones that claim to have but not really you you, you put a machine in front of me and i'll work out with this machine or not pretty quickly anybody with a a, a, a a sensible level of intellect can tell whether it's a machine or not with just some choice questioning so we're not there yet in terms of ai um but I wonder whether quantum computing is going to be the last piece of that puzzle, right? Once we get that kind of processing power, are, is that the point where, you know, the singularity becomes a reality and we actually get consciousness in a machine? So I think that's pretty fascinating. 
well, I think on that bombshell, we should probably wrap it up before we get too deep, because that's a rabbit hole. <laughs> before we before we get too deep, I think yeah. I think that I think that ship might have sailed. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dave, it's been a pleasure uh, as always. I appreciate your time and thoughts on all these topics. Um, until next week. Until next week. Thanks very much. Talk to you soon, Brad. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. This podcast was brought to you by Samurai Digital Security, purveyors of cybersecurity solutions. Find us at samuraisecurity.co.uk and follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook. Samurai Security, tearing cybersecurity a new R since 2015.